This episode brought to you by HelloFresh. Delicious pre-measured ingredients and simple chef-made recipes delivered to your doorstep every week. The nostalgia critic guy, remember it? Sigh. Hello? Sigh. Why, do you have something to say, real Tolkien fan? Oh, I was just sighing at the misfortune that you have to review that god awful animated Lord of the Rings. <laughs> the Ralph Bakshi one? No, oh, I mean, I've talked about it before in the past, and even though I do like the Jackson films more, I do think there's a lot of good things about it. No, there's not. Oh, I'm sorry it did nothing for you, but I actually got quite a bit out of it. No, you did. Dude, how do you know what I got out of it? Because no real fan would enjoy something so beneath us. Oh, is that so real movie fan? God, your parents give you weird names. Yes, we smelt the stench of this film and wanted to congratulate you for tearing it apart. Look, I know this film isn't that beloved, but honestly, I think it gets way too much hate. Gas! Double gas! I hope you mean that ironically. No, I legit really like this film. Are you not aware of the masterpieces that are the Peter Jackson movies? Though wait, are we at the point where we dislike them yet? No, we have to wait for one one more botched Tolkien project, and then we can say we always thought they were overrated. Ah, okay, I know a lot of people make fun of this movie, especially after the Peter Jackson trilogy came out, but I still think there's a lot to praise about it. Nope, there's nothing. Not one thing, huh? It's just a crazy film by a crazy man who doesn't understand cinema or Tolkien. You wanna say that to my face, you elitist bastard? Ah, oh, great, you got Ralph Bakshi involved. So what? He's kind of like social distancing. Far away, there's a lot to study. Up close, it might be dangerous. Well, good thing we're extremely far away. Oh, hey, you got something on your face. Come closer. Oh. <laughs> How did you do that? Things rarely make sense with him. Oh, yeah, well, Peter Jackson took years to film his masterpieces, and you lazily told people to draw. I appreciate where the real talent is at. Oh, you're so right. That's why I mailed you a present for being so smart. Oh, so you have. <laughs> well, how kind of you to kindly be so kind. Ah! How dare you call me lazy, you brainless babbling bimbo? Do you know how many armies I had to direct in the freezing cold? How many directors said this couldn't be filmed? How many fans, including Peter Jackson, may not have heard of Lord of the Rings if it weren't for me? Yeah, maybe we should give a little background before we go any further. First off, nobody, including the people that made it, would call this film perfect. But it did take more steps in furthering recognition for both animation and Tolkien than many give credit. In the 70s, animation was in kind of a strange time. Disney was turning out very few films, and what they did turn out was not as mind-blowing as they once were. So this opened the door for other animators to experiment. Ralph Bakshi found success making animation for adults with a risque style that, much like the man himself, people either love or hate. I love them, if for any other reason, just to see how many people would be offended watching them today. Why does a great actor like James Earl Jones always have to play black men? God, I love these movies. But with that said, the idea of Ralph Bakshi making a Lord of the Rings movie seemed as odd as, well, Peter Jackson making a Lord of the Rings movie. Much like Jackson, though, Bakshi pushed the envelope of what could be done in his field and combined his weird take on the world with the love and respect he had for Tolkien's work. Thus, the film ambitiously tried a style of animation rarely tackled on such a grand scale, rotoscope. The art of filming your subject and then animating over them to place them in different styles and environments. Nowadays, people do this all the time with CG and motion capture, but back then, this was the closest you had to putting any character of any design in any world of any design. It was a type of filmmaking that would morph over the years into something that's now very common. With that said, it still didn't have the budget a film like this needed, resulting in a lot of inconsistencies and maybe some artistic choices that would make more sense in Fritz the Cat than Lord of the Rings. But that's also part of what makes it so unique. It really isn't a film you can categorize in one box. 
So, even though I've compared this film to Jackson's in the past, I want to take a closer look at it just on its own, to see what works, what doesn't, and even what could never fall into either category. So let's look at the good, the bad, and whatever you call the strangeness of Bakshi. Do you mind if I'm upside down for a minute? Sure. Thank you. That doesn't make sense, and therefore it's bad. Boom! You're a dog's head now. So I am. This is 1978's Lord of the Rings. The film opens with simple but effective shadow play, giving the backstory about the one ring to rule them all, made by the Dark Lord Sauron. With the One Ring, Middle-earth is his, and he cannot be overcome. Even the elves' dog and bunny impressions did nothing. The ring is chopped off and passed from person to person, eventually ending up in the hands of a hobbit named Gollum. Who will look less like Doc Brown with Wreck-It Ralph hands. It's found by Bilbo Baggins the Hobbit, who takes it home to the Shire. <laughs> currently being directed by Rankin Bass. And decides years later it's time to leave. His friend Gandalf the Wizard wishes him well. Ish. Have you left the ring for Frodo as we agree? It's mine, I tell you! My precious! Do not say that again. Don't make me slap you with my ring finger! Oh, that's right, I'm not married. Give me that. <laughs> he snaps him back to his senses, and Bilbo leaves never to return. Seventeen years passed sleepily in the Shire. In a very sloppy edit. Gandalf! <laughs> That was about a half hour from the Jackson film in six minutes. Usually there's bunnies or an ADD idiot required for such a crunch. It's the ring, isn't it? Bilbo's funny magic ring. You always used to look like that when you talked about it. That is one of the things you'll notice, though. Because it is so short and they have to cram in so much, every scene counts. They have to make you feel like this world is real, establish these characters, make you like these characters, and squeeze in a buttload of story. And with almost one-third the running time and one-eleventh the budget, it's amazing they did this as well as they did. Usually keeping good pacing in an animation style that was very mature for its time. Compare this to what Disney was putting out a year earlier. There was usually big movements, goofy voices, kid-friendly stuff like most animation then. This moved more dramatically, quietly. It wasn't afraid to give you slower moments despite being in such a time crunch. But with that said, it is still a Bakshi film, which of course means there's gonna be some weird over-the-top moments as well. Like how about this weird pointing? You are the one who has the ring now. What are you gonna do, shoot me with that thing? JESUS! It's almost silent film acting, which creates a strange contrast sometimes with the usually grounded voiceovers. Until he passes into the world of shadows. And always twirling, twirling, twirling towards freedom. Even Frodo sometimes gives a face like, What the hell is going on right now? Regardless, the film still holds your attention as Gandalf tells Frodo the ring is evil and he cannot use it, as he will become too dangerous. Then I suppose I must keep the ring and guard it. And I ought to go away somewhere alone. They won't bother the Shire if the ring isn't here. I know I've said it before, but I really do like the way this film gets going better than the other one. I think a lot of that is because Frodo takes more initiative and responsibility in this. He doesn't just solve a riddle and then fall or cry. Sometimes both. For all the pros this movie has, though, it does cost us a Gamgee. What have you heard? And why did you listen? Oh, Mr. Frodo, sir. What is that performance? Why are you acting that way? Stop it. Don't let him turn me into anything unnatural. Yeah, I guess the idea of Sam was he was supposed to be the comedic levity the same way Mary and Pippin were in the Jackson film. But man, every time I see him, he gets worse. Me go and see the elves? Oh my! Oh, hooray! Wait a On the one hand, I guess the exaggerated simplicity does make his dedication to Frodo all the more touching. Not that way. You know what? Take it that way. I don't care anymore. But I'm sorry, the Sam from the book does not deserve doody do music. <laughs> oh. Despite Sam I ain't, Frodo starts his journey bringing Merry and Pippin along as Gandalf meets Saruman at Skeletor's hideout. I have come for your aid in troubled times. The Nine are abroad, darkness approaches, the Black Riders. God, I want to start every conversation that way. I have come for your aid in troubled times. The Nine are abroad. Darkness approaches. The Black Riders. 
I'm changing my number. I'm honestly shocked it took you this long. But Gandalf discovers Saruman is totally Slytherin. A new age is upon us. A new power is rising. You are saying that we should join with Mordor? You are the worst Santa in our mall order. You wish the children happy life day, don't you? Would you rather see the Dark Lord have it? Or Saruman of many colors! Saruman flashes Gandalf and leaves him on top of his tower via Jackson Pollock's staff. Our hobbit friends aren't doing much better as they're confronted by a black rider. I like how a little more twisted and otherworldly he looks, though the sounds he makes can be a little much. <laughs> Was that a sound of defeat or a guy getting a blowjob while stretching? <laughs> Pippin admit they're aware of Frodo's mission, and they're coming with him whether he likes it or not. You can trust us to stick to you through thick and thin, to the bitter end, but you cannot trust us to let you face trouble alone and go off without a word. It's funny, Merry and Pippin in this version feel more like real people, but not real people I know very well. Or in Jackson's film, they feel more like movie characters, but they're very fleshed out movie characters. While I like this version fine, I will admit I don't really know the difference between them, apart from Mary is the one that makes this weird Humphrey the Bear face. <sighs> Bless you, you deceitful scoundrels. Hooray! <laughs> they make it to the inn, where the animation looks a little... <laughs> too real? This is in part because the cinematographer who shot the footage to rotoscope said he could solarize it overexposing the film and coloring it to make it look more real and save time. On characters like the orcs it looks good, but on regular people it doesn't gel as well as the more expressive line work. The backgrounds you may notice also are a little inconsistent, sometimes bright and colorful and other times more sketchy like out of a book illustration. Exactly. Less consistency means less art. You say something, Colonel Dingus! It was her! Huh? <laughs> Let's bring up a good question, Bakshi. Why do the backgrounds vary? I mean, sometimes they look like something out of Sleeping Beauty, and other times they don't even look entirely finished. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want one style like in the Jackson film? They are pretty. And consistent. What was that? Her again. You see, in animation, you're not just bound to one style. Like in American Pop, the backgrounds reflected the style of whatever time period we were in. So why not do the same thing with fantasy? In a calmer and more relaxed environment, you could go for more solid lines and cooler colors. In a more rustic environment, you could go for more of a paperback illustration. And in a more threatening environment, go more abstract and become more intense and otherworldly. You see, you can't do that in live action. Only animation. Why settle for one style of fantasy when you could have several? Oh, it's certainly throwing everything at the dartboard to see what sticks. Actually, that inspires me. Really? While going for a walk, Mary is exposed to Confunk and passes out. Back at the end, the hobbits come across Aragorn, played by John Hurt. A lot of people took issue that he looked different from the book, having more of a Native American design. Oh, imagine replacing a white dude with a different ethnicity. Next, you'll be telling me the live-action reference for Frodo was a woman. But John Hurt's performance still gives me chills for how good it is. Lothlorien is a place of healing. There is no evil in it, unless a man brings evil there with him. I can see Viggo Mortensen as a ranger, but not as king. This dude, I can easily see as both. Even when he says lines like this. They'll come on you in the wild. Okay, that's a different Bakshi movie. Frodo! Frodo, I've seen them! I've seen them! Oh! Son of a bitch! Them. I don't need this. I was the first one to die an alien. Save us. Strider came to offer me his help. In your place, I wouldn't take up with a ranger out of the wild. Did I mention my split personality? It changes opinions in literally seconds. Save us. In your place, I wouldn't take up with a ranger out of the wild. Did I miss something? <gasps> I really love how Aragorn makes it clear he's not messing around in this scene, though it is a little jaded when you see his weapon. If I wanted the ring for myself, I could have it. Now. Oh damn it, a full sword was supposed to come out of that. Please be intimidated. Just imagine it's sharp at the end of that. The hobbits agree to go with him as later that night the Black Riders sneak in and give a harsh wake-up call. 
Use your words, Frank. He's always like this when he doesn't get his apple jacks. What the hell? They fool the Black Riders and they make their way toward Weathertop. But Luthien Tenuvio was the daughter of a king of elves. It's pretty cool that Aragorn tells a story that will mirror his own with an elf falling in love with a human, sacrificing her immortality for him. And it's nice foreshadowing, even if it's only explored in the Jackson films. She followed him, and so he was her doom. But he was her love as well. Oh, and her life force was also tied to a ring of power. For absolutely no reason. Yeah, that will never make sense. The Black Riders surround our heroes who are terrified and maybe a little stoned, but Frodo puts on the ring. No. Hi, guy. <laughs> the Black Riders are chased off and the shard slowly starts to make its way into Frodo's heart. No, I thought Arwen wasn't in this movie. Legolas. They come across Legolas, played by Anthony Daniels. And I never did mind that both versions switched up who they come across as in the book they're approached by Glorfindel. Who? Exactly. So I think this makes more sense. I have been on the road for nine days. Mr. Frodo has been on the road a lot longer than that, and he needs a rest. Am I gonna have to cut a hobbitch? The Black Riders catch up, but luckily they have Aragorn to protect them. They have Legolas to protect Fly. Fly, the enemy is upon us. You know, Frodo, just run. I'm not entirely sure why everything goes slower here, like he put the ring on, or why Frodo suddenly sounds like a ten-year-old in this one line. Go back! Maybe he went through the same five puberties the Sword and the Stone Kid did. Oh, Sir Actor! Whoa, what? Whoa! But the scene is still creepy, like something out of a fever dream. Tomorrow we will take you. They sound nice. Take a chance! The river rises up against the evil riders, and Frodo wakes up in Rivendell. Verily I come. Give it unto you. No, never. Get off me, Sam. Yes, I am here. They heal Frodo up, and Gandalf tells them how he escaped from Saruman. The great eagle Gwahir came in answer to my call. Saruman has never paid enough attention to animals. Much to his father, Sam Eagle's discontent. Freakles one, civilization zero. He's reunited with Bilbo, who naturally wants to see the One Ring one more time. Put it away. They call a council where many have different ideas what should be done with the One Ring. I am Boromir. In a dream, I heard a voice crying to me, Seek for the sword that was broken. Here is the sword of Elendil of Gondor. Okay, I know I said I wouldn't do that many comparisons to the Jackson films, as I really do like them more and I think they're better put together, but... God, I love how they talk in this film! It's in the other version too, but you also have pandering lines like central nervous systems and dwarf women have beards and mission quest thing. Here, they just go for it. Everyone talks with that epic demeanor that was in the book. When someone starts off a sentence with, in a dream, I actually want to know what that dream's about. As opposed to that friend who's just going to end the sentence with, isn't that weird? In a dream, I heard a voice crying to me, seek for the sword that was broken. And you had these wooden teeth. How <laughs> do you like that? <laughs> Frodo says it makes the most sense for him to go to Mordor and drop the ring into Mount Doom. Thus the Fellowship is formed to help him on his journey. The storm gets too powerful though, so they discuss the possibility of going through the mines of Moria. We might go by way of the Gap of Rohan. That would take the ring too close to Isengard and Aruman. Okay, I always wonder, Bakshi, how come half the time they don't say Saruman, they say Aroman? They drop the S. Well, that was the studio's fault. Really? Seems like an odd call. Oh yeah, no, get this. Halfway through, one of the producers decided that Sauron and Saruman sounded so similar. So he decided to change his name to Aroman. To the wizard Aroman. And Aroman. Perhaps it should have been his friend Aroman. No, it must be Aroman. It's Aroman. By the time I found this out, the lines were already recorded, and I couldn't get a reactor back to re-record them. Really? You couldn't do ADR? Well, we did it in one scene. But he said to leave as soon as we could. And Mary and Pepin insisted on coming with us as far as Bree. Okay, maybe it's best she didn't try. I guess I could have made an F sound and put it at the beginning of his name. How long since Th Aramon? Th Only because Th Aramon is kind. Th Aramon's poison too close to Isengard. S and Aruman. Better? Stranger. Th 
means it's better! This species is known as a woodpecker. He nibbles at trees to find bugs for nourishment. This species is known as a squirrel. He nibbles at trees because he is stupid. But alas, what have we here? The rare breed of HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Observe, if you will, the pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door, allowing you to skip those trips to the grocery store and making cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable. Here is HelloFresh with some monkeys. Few people know that monkeys love being in HelloFresh sponsorships, especially ones that have monkeys. They also love that HelloFresh's recipes are delicious. There's something for everyone, including low-calorie, vegetarian, and family-friendly recipes every week. Here is HelloFresh with some bears. Fear not, there are no bears in these recipes. But with HelloFresh, you can eat more sustainably. For HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients means there's less prep for you and less food waste. Here is HelloFresh with a bunny. HelloFresh is often confused for a bunny, but he is not. He is HelloFresh which is flexible and fits your lifestyle. Easily change your delivery days or food preferences and skip a week whenever you need. Here is HelloFresh trying to cheer this puppy up. That's a downer. You know it's not a downer though. HelloFresh. HelloFresh has donated over 2.5 million meals to charity in 2019. And this year, it's stepping up their food donations amid the coronavirus crisis. One of the great things about HelloFresh is that I personally cannot cook, but with their easy-to-make recipes, I can make extraordinary meals in no time at all. Here's HelloFresh with an antelope. What am I supposed to say to that? I don't know. But you can get a special offer. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Critic80 and use the promo code Critic80 to get a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash Critic80 and use the code Critic80 to get $80 off. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. This was a man thinking he could do a British accent saying, Bonjour, amigos, as the Brits say. Like our videos? Subscribe to be notified about them. Want to actually be notified about them? Click on that bell as well. Also, don't forget to check us out on Twitch. Playing some games, telling some jokes, and overall having a good time. Hope to see you there. The Fellowship makes it to the mine's entrance when Tentacle Hentai grabs Frodo. I'm coming, Mr. Frodo! Oh, thank God, I'm saved. I love how Boromir pushes Sam like he's not even helping in the slightest. He can't even stand after such a light nudge. Yes, Sam, you're saving the day. Piss off and play with your G.I. Joes, little idiot. Into the gateway, all of you! And stay in! They slowly but surely make their way through, with Gandalf staying calm and collected. Be quiet, Pippin. Be still! What's that? Be quiet, both of you! Throw yourself in next time! I don't want to stay here. Oh, I almost slapped you! But orcs attack. The Shire! Arg me! Mouseketeers! Yeah, she was a Mouseketeer too. Spin the wheel of random! Come no closer! Come no closer, I warn you! Oh, I can't believe that worked. Uh, could you stab yourselves next? That'd be very helpful. They're approached by the Balrog, and Gandalf breaks the bridge, causing him to fall. Which, seeing how he has wings, I question. <laughs> he takes Gandalf with him, and our heroes mourn by leaning on each other. Literally, Legolas leans on Pippin. What the hell? Out of Moria into the Golden Wood. Is there no way less perilous? They make it to Lothlorien, which looks pretty and all, but something about Galadriel and Celeborn always looked like they were part of a furniture showroom. I am Galadriel, and this is my lord Celeborn. Welcome to our variety show. I'm a little bit country. I'm a little bit rock and roll. The elves sing a song about Gandalf, which sadly isn't played in its entirety. Check out the full song if you can, it's actually quite beautiful. And Galadriel brings Sam and Frodo to a fountain to see what could be in their future. And not all have yet come to pass. Some never come to be. So, like YouTube conspiracy theories? Pretty much, yes. Feeling the weight of the ring, Frodo offers it to Galadriel. I will give you the one ring, if you ask for it. 
It's too great a matter for me. <laughs> okay. Galadriel's house, bitches! You will set up a queen stronger than the foundations of the earth. All shall love me and despair. Oh, is that what it does? I had no idea! <laughs> They leave Lothlorien and continue on their quest. For Gondor and the house of Isildur. For Gondor and the city of Minas Tirith. I'm not putting my sword down till you do. I had it up first. Mine was more poetic. Fine, we'll just stand like this the whole boat ride. Great. Terrific. Splendid. I have to pee. Me too. Boromir confronts Frodo, asking for the ring to defend his people, but Frodo refuses, knowing it will turn anyone who wears it to evil. And for themselves, they may be right, these elves and half-elves and wizards. But true-hearted men will not be corrupted. You don't keep track of American... anything, do you? Boromir tries to take it for himself, and Frodo flees. Sam finds him trying to sneak away on a boat. If I hadn't a guessed right, where would you be now? Safely on my way. Safely? All alone and without me to help you? I love how they're so deep in conversation they're not aware that they're technically rowing in opposite directions. It'd be so funny if everyone got to the Black Gate and returned to the king and it was like... For Frodo. There'd be three more movies just wondering where the hell they are. Merry and Pippin, though, come across orcs nearby. Ah, bling. We prefer vertically impaired. Formir tries to save them, but in a grisly scene right out of Game of Thrones, arrow after arrow leads to his bloody death. Boromir. Oh, you'll be fine. Go to Minas Tirith. Save my people. I will go. My animation might be a little Bible school, but I'll get there. Boromir dies, and the remaining Fellowship decide to go after Merry and Pippin, captured by the orcs. <laughs> Sheesh, I know you're in pain, but do you have to sound like Shemp Howard drowning? <laughs> They're stopped by Aromir's men, and I will admit this is the only part of the movie that really drags. It's kind of confusing, but I think they're at a standstill, and every once in a while one may attack, and then they're at a standstill again, and it all looks pretty ugly. The biggest fight seems to be with the orcs deciding how many arrows to use. No shooting! No wasting arrows! Dung the hill, swine! And you six on the left! Move! You look like Vegas Mimes who died! It's no good groping in the dark. Well, that up the rating. One of the soldiers saves them, and they escape to come across a talking tree. Not a tree, a tree herder. Bet you didn't know Christopher Lee was in both these versions. I think he even modeled for this one. You may call me Treebeard. That's an odd name. It's not like calling a person Manstache. Awkward animation at 12 o'clock. Tree killing ox and their masters. <laughs> Did their applause need a minute to load? What was that? <laughs> Meanwhile, Frodo and Sam are approached by the walking turd Gollum, who is not very cooperative. I think your rope might prove <laughs> useful again, Sam. No, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> Jesus, it's like asking a Karen to put on a mask. Smeagol will be very good. They get him to calm down and lead them to Mount Doom, while Aragorn and the others have a surprise visitor of their own. Oh! <laughs> Gandalf! <laughs> oh, that moment passed. Gandalf! He explains what happened after he and the Belrog fell. Until at last he fled back up the secret ways of Moria above the mists of the world. Wait, no, you're supposed to have landed on top of another mountain. Yeah, how did they explain that? He tells them of the attack that's about to occur on Helm's Deep and the importance of getting King Theoden to protect it. Theoden has grown old and leaves everything in the hands of his new minister, Rhymer Wormtongue. He was going to go with another advisor, surely happy truth-teller, but he had a gut feeling about the name Wormtongue, you know? So they follow Gandalf the White, uh, I mean Grey, or Kay White, and they put Wormtongue in his place. Theoden is told about his lies and asks Rhymer if he truly is working for Saruman. I will not harm you. Is it so? <sighs> Does that count as a no? My sister daughter. My sister, my daughter! Eowyn, 
My only loyal kin. My backstory is... Oh, never mind. Just over two hours for God. Theoden gets his army ready, leading to one of the film's more cryptic moments. Aragorn. My lord. Is there any hope for us? Does that count as a no? Okay, you need to read the room. The armies are in place, the sky goes red, and we begin... Honestly, a really friggin' awesome battle. The red makes the orcs look like something right out of hell. The music is just as cryptic as anything from Howard Shore's score. And this is the first time an animated film could show a battle with hundreds of people on a scale like this. Well, nowadays you would just CGI all that shit, but we couldn't do that. So we had to film the armies attacking the castle, and then not only draw over them, but place more soldiers in the background so it appeared larger than it was! But even knowing that, there's still a battle you had to shoot outside a castle with all these extras. Yeah, it took forever to set those shots up. In fact, after God knows how long to get all the extras in place and their actions synchronized, a producer yelled, LAUNCH! before I could even get the shot! So some of the footage you see is literally them walking to lunch. Oh, so that's why some of them are holding sandwiches. Yes, but the battle in the other film had more stunts and looked more realistic, therefore it was better. Oh yeah, well sure, you could do more stunts when you're frickin' invincible! They leap into certain death a million times and never get a scratch on them! If I did that, they'd say I made it too cartoony! I knew if I wanted people to take it seriously, it had to be more violent and gory! When someone gets hacked, it really feels like someone's getting hacked! They don't always have the best strategies, though. Like, look here. Arrows are being fired and no one takes cover. That's your biggest problem? How about asking why they're using a battering ram on a wall with the doors right there? Oh, yeah. Wait, did you just help make my point? Well, I mean, that depends. Is that you screaming from a monster's mouth? Oh, God, not again! <laughs> Yeah, I thought I'd give you a break, sweetie. That's very common. <laughs> oh no, Emerald Boom is attacking with his fireworks. Be attacked by hot dogs. Hot dogs. Saruman sends his magic to break down the walls, forcing the armies to retreat into the caves. I will not end here. Will you ride with me then? We may make such an end, as will be worth a song. Who'd sing the song? Rune 5? I'm out. Let's see how Frodo and Sam are doing. Nice and dressed here, silly hobbies. They're fine. Back to the kick-ass battle. After a great scene where they sound the charging horn, which confuses the orcs, so they run away. It's actually really funny. Rohan rides out and gets a few good kills before they appear to be outnumbered. does a good job making you think this might actually be their last stand before, you know, everything started that fake out. But Gandalf brings an army in time as well as the theme to Star Trek IV. They fight back the orcs, Gandalf throws his sword in the air, it presumably falls on Legolas. Stop! Didn't even get the 3PO joke! And we're given one of the main reasons people hated this movie when it first came out. I had the first part the history of the War of the Ring. Yep, nobody was told this was a two-parter. Despite Bakshi saying people would be pissed, the film was advertised as simply Lord of the Rings. Not part one, not Fellowship of the Ring, not even the Two Towers, just Lord of the Rings, all in one movie. Both newcomers and fans of the books were furious, to the point where when it was released on DVD, a longer narration made it very clear this was part one, despite there never being a part two. So too ends the first great tale of The Lord of the Rings. The thought was folks wouldn't pay to see only one half of a movie. Not knowing they'd be even more pissed if they were straight up lied to. Huh, so the film was such a disappointment they never made a sequel. Mm, not exactly. Rankin Bass, the people who made the animated Hobbit, also made an animated Return of the King. It's completely different in style, but it does wrap up the story if anyone wanted to see an animated ending. But, nevertheless, the film bombed so hard, no one would dare dream to make another. Actually, despite the hate it gets, it was a financial success. What? 
In fact, it inspired other adaptations of Lord of the Rings, including a popular radio production that even brought in some of the actors from the film. The sequel wasn't made because so many people were pissed off at it, and Bakshi eventually had a falling out with the producers. Well, whatever. As long as people hate it. Well, there's certainly many of those, but I really feel like something's being lost by completely dismissing it. Bakshi's film is like a rustic, beautiful mug, compared to Jackson films, which is like a polished, highly manufactured beautiful mug. Yes, one is technically better made and has fewer flaws, but there's still admirable artistry and effort put into the flawed one. They're both impressive works in their own right. Jackson even took inspiration from Bakshi's film, lifting some scenes directly from this version and even ending two towers at the same point despite the book not ending them. The film is also reportedly what got Jackson into the Lord of the Rings books. And I'll admit, the same can be said for me. When I saw this film, it was unlike any other animated film I'd ever seen. I immediately wanted to know more about this world and was blown away that a realistic style very similar to Disney could be taken so seriously for adults. When I did read the books, I was more amazed at how much was the same as opposed to how much was left out. Remember, adaptations back then took even more liberties than films today. There was no internet yet for fans to complain about the differences. And, maybe because we do have other film versions now, it is growing a bit of a fan base. You see it referenced in things like South Park, and people are digging it as kind of the grindhouse version of the epic story. It's the low-budget take that probably bit off more than it could chew, but it's such an artistic mouthful. Look, I get people who don't like it. I really do. Its problems are very obvious. But to dismiss the entire film of having no value is to ignore some brilliant artistry, wonderful acting, and stylistic storytelling. It's flawed, but even its flaws have a strange kind of beauty to them. So, if you want to see an interpretation that's not perfect, but still engagingly unique, this is one of the most artistically pleasing adaptations you'll ever see. Well, I totally agree. Really? No, I just don't want Bashki to go insane again. Well, that's my secret, Cap. I'm always insane. <laughs> With the weather vane spin, alas, it's time to leave. Wait, Bashki! Will you ever return? When the wind changes, dear lad. When the wind changes. Why then? It's intentionally vague. That way I can come back whenever. So long, Ralph Bakshi. Don't stay away too long. I do whatever I want, you Nixon voting crypto fascist! Oh, I lost my Tamor. Oh my! Oh hooray! Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out. No, your eyes are not deceiving you. If you saw last week's charity shout out, I am wearing the exact same Mr. Bill shirt because I actually do these uh, back to back here, but uh, uh, they are still different charities. And uh, the one we are doing this week is uh, Preemptive Love. And what they do normally is uh, their coalition stretching across Iraq, Syria, and the United States and beyond, working together to unmake violence and create a more beautiful world. A wonderful uh, uh, charity, a, a wonderful mission, uh, but they are also working uh, specifically with battling the uh, coronavirus and what they're doing for that. Uh, they're rushing food to thousands of refugees and communities uh, locked down with no other way to eat. They're providing urgent medical care to families in Syria and on the Venezuela, Venezuela board, border. I can talk. Border now facing the double threat of COVID-19. They're creating digital jobs that can be done anywhere, whether you're stuck at home uh, by the virus or forced to flee by war. And their CIO, uh, CEO is even cutting his pay to zero dollars to protect the investment in relief and jobs for their refugee friends, as well as their team of 100 plus people who make this work possible. So this is not only a wonderful uh, organization 
Ryan, but uh, like many of the charities we promote on here, it has four star uh, four stars on Charity Navigator, and they just do really fantastic work. So please see if you can donate to them. If not, just spread the word. Spread the word of all the good people doing good work, because there are so many out there, and they deserve so much attention. So take a look when you have time, and I'll see you next time. Take care.